Every company everywhere is pursuing operational excellence whether they have the vocabulary for it or not. You could think of operational excellence as two objectives. The first one is effectiveness, being able to nail what your customers want. The second is efficiency, being able to do it with minimal byproduct. So whether they have the vocabulary for it or not, every company everywhere is trying to achieve these two objectives. Well, in the software industry, we've learned that the Agile movement has helped us tremendously with the first objective, effectiveness. Getting closer to our customers, short feedback cycles, prioritizing what's most valuable to them, planning at multiple levels so that we can pivot and adjust where we need to has been a wonderful combination that's helped us achieve great things in the effectiveness objective. For efficiency though, and that's a different challenge. We're trying to do all the things that make us effective with minimal byproduct. A few companies are able to do this and the rest deal with a whole lot of chaos we call the hidden factory. Everything you have to do over again because it didn't go right the first time. Think about your group. What percentage of their efforts are lost to the hidden factory? Most groups I talk to, the number is about 35%. Just think what if you could reclaim that? What if you could deliver your projects 35% faster, uh, monetize your investments 35% faster, not have to deal with 35% of the, the effort drain and schedule loss, this hidden factory problem. That's what quality systems promise you. There's several of them out there. There's CMMI, there's ISO 9000 for software, there's ITIL, uh, COBIT, and there's some other popular ones that are outside of IT, like the Toyota production system that we call Lean today. And there's a stable framework. All of these are very similar, but this is how stable's different. First, it's new, and it's designed to work along with Scrum. You can put stable right on top of a, a Scrum group, and it works very smoothly with what the team is doing. Also, stable works standalone if you have a team that's not building anything, like an operations group or a DevOps group, or even an implementation group they can use stable right out of the box and it's a lot better fit for them than something like scrum is for groups that are not really sprinting anywhere in addition stable doesn't require you hire any new people to implement it you can use your existing team and uh, can be implemented also stable does not require annual audits from these big organizations to come in and you know spend three months with your team at uh, your cost to to tell everybody that you're compliant the beauty about stable is along with other performance management systems the the uh, the effects of using stable will be self-evident very quickly so i'm going to now tell you a little bit about um, where stable came from and then i'm going to get into the a certified stable associate program this story starts a long time ago um 15 20 years ago i guess maybe 20 years ago uh, I was a software development manager for a medical software company, and I started realizing after a while that um, we had a certain percentage of our effort that was devoted to firefighting. You know, I won't tell you the percent yet. I'm going to ask you to think about your own environment, think about what that number would be. I noticed as the months went by that it seemed like it was about the same amount of effort proportionally that we were spending on firefighting. And... Um, the problems were different every month. We just we were just were spending time on these problems. And so after realizing it was sort of a constant, we could add to our estimation process. I went and talked to the CEO and was kind of excited about this discovery. I said, you know, the reality of it is it's taken us six weeks to do, you know, this many weeks of work. And um, that's that's a problem we've never really um, focused on before. So with this new information, we can make even more accurate estimates. And he rolled his eyes and said, you know, I've seen this problem before. We're going to have some quality gurus come in and spend some time with you and the rest of the company, and um, they're going to help you solve this problem. And I walked out of his office thinking, oh, you know, good man, you know, he really means well, but, uh, you know, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about manufacturing like cars or something, and, you know, you put a door on a car 10,000 times the same way, but software's nothing like that. Anyway, I didn't tell him not to. I just kind of walked out of his office. So fast forward a bunch of months and um, the, the quality team shows up. They spent a year with our company and they went through all the departments in the company and they got to development last. And I think they did it on purpose because they realized it would be a little bit of a fight. And so they showed up and I was two guys and I said, you know, Heard a lot of good things about what you guys are doing. Um, I said, I, I got to tell you, I'm skeptical. Uh, I don't really understand how um, these concepts are going to work with software because 
manufacturing a car, doing the same thing 10,000 times is different than how we work here. We do, uh, you know, everything we do is different. We innovate, we're always creating new, new um, versions of the software and new components and whatnot. And it's not like putting a car door on 10,000 times. And they said, well, um, they said, okay. They said, uh, here's how we're going to proceed. We're going to start with a central repository where we're going to store knowledge. And in the central repository, we're going to um, have you uh, identify all the repeatable processes you do inside your departments. And then we're going to create standard operating procedures and a quality checklists for your team to use. And um, I kind of stopped them and said, well, that's just it. We, we don't do anything repeatable here. This is software development. And they said, well, you hire new employees, don't you? I said, yeah. Isn't that repeatable? Uh, you you uh, set up their workstations, don't you? Yeah. You know, we configure them for all the programming tools. And he said, well, isn't that repeatable? Well, yeah, I guess it is. How about when people leave? Do you debrief them? Yeah. Well, isn't that repeatable? Uh, yeah, I guess it is. And they said, okay, what else do you do over and over again in this department? And I thought about it and thought, well, we, we, um, you know, we, we push a, a build into production. If it's, you know, passes testing, that's repeatable. And I suppose the testing process is repeatable. And actually, I guess the build process is repeatable. And in time, I realized that the whole software development process is a bunch of repeatable steps. You have the requirements process, that's repeatable. The architecture process, that's repeatable. The um, component design process for your screens and reports, that's repeatable. The coding process is repeatable. And so if you think about it like that, now you're talking about repeatable processes. And all of a sudden you can apply concepts from lean and the Toyota production system and all that stuff to um, to what you do. And so uh, we did. So we started implying um, what they taught us. And they said, they said, there's, there's a few things we're going to construct here. We're going to create standard operating procedures. We know that nobody's ever going to read. And so we're going to do that for you. Don't worry about that. Just describe what you do and we'll write it up. And, and, and they said, think about that as kind of a place to hang more information. That's really the value of the standard operating procedure. And so it's like, okay. And then we're going to give you, uh, you're going to create a quality checklist at every repeatable step. And then your, your job, your people's job is as you perform these repeatable steps to always check with the quality list, the, the, the checklist, and um, make sure you've, you've accounted for whatever's on that checklist at that step. That, that's, that's your job. That's, that's um, how you work a quality system. And it's like, well, okay. So we kind of humored them and we kind of did this stuff and, you know, it was okay. It really wasn't that bad to do, um, but we didn't really understand what the big deal was about. And then we had our first real emergency. It was like a week later, first big fire. There was some doctor with some big problem in his clinic and he had a bunch of people in his waiting room and it's really uncomfortable. When you write medical software and there's a bunch of people jammed up in a doctor's waiting room and something's wrong with the software, that, that's not a good place to be. So, um, so we, we kind of rushed this new fix to whatever the problem was. And uh, one of the rules we were operating under was that the, um, the uh, people, uh, these, these two gentlemen that came in to teach us about quality needed to sign off on anything that went into production. And so we kind of rushed this build, this, this you know, hot fix together and, oh yeah, we got to get them to sign it off. And so we stuck it in front of them and said, oh, do you mind um, signing this off? Because we got to get this to this doctor right now. And they said, okay, where's your quality checklist? And we we're like, uh, what? Well, yeah, we need to see your quality checklist. Just like we taught you to do during normal conditions where you're filling out your quality checklist to, to push a build into production. We need to see them for this hotfix. And it was like, no, you don't understand. This is an emergency. And they said, no, you don't understand. Nothing goes out the door unless we see those checklists. Okay. So we spent about two hours going back and going through everything again. We found a problem midway through the process. Uh, there was a glitch we missed, and and had we actually pushed this build into production at the doctor's office, we would have caused even more carnage. So, as a team, we were humbled. It was like, oh, that's what this is about, and we we kind of got some religion about quality and uh, started to take the whole process seriously. And it wasn't very long, maybe five weeks later since we started, since those, those guys came and talked to us and we implemented what they taught us, 
there were no fires we were fighting, like none. We sat there with a full bandwidth. We were working on our project work, uh, 100% of the bandwidth we had instead of a smaller number. And we we all just marveled at each other. This thing really works. There's like no issues here. And um, that's pretty much how it remained the rest of the time I was with that company. It was a good year and a half or something. It's kind of funny. Later, I was interviewing for a job and um, I remember the CIO asking me, so you're the software development manager. What do you actually do every day? And I said, you know, I just kind of, um, you know, keep track of the, the, the how the projects are tracking and spend most of my time reading tech books. And he's like, what? And I said, well, yeah, I, I read tech books. Uh, and, and his, you know, I didn't understand at the time his reaction. I get it now. He, he was in complete disbelief that there's a software development manager that's not firefighting all the time. That that was that was his reaction. And um, so, um, uh, you know, th that's how it was, though. And people that I've wor they worked with at the time that I've talked to since, you know, they're like, Mike, you know, we I tried to get the checklist thing working at um, this new, new company I'm at or the last two companies in, but nobody takes me seriously. Like, they don't believe me. They don't understand what I'm trying to talk about. You know, that was so nice how we had it where, you know, everything was working so smooth for months and months and months and months. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it really was, wasn't it? So um, fast forward about, I don't know, seven years or something. I'm at a, a company writing some manufacturing process control software for them. And um, it's they it's a company that has um, really, really high tech, high end stuff. They have some components on the Mars rover on Mars. You know, it's pretty cool bragging rights to 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 have a product on Mars. So um, they have one of those clean room facilities where you put on the spacesuit. They, they call them bunny suits in the industry, but you put on the spacesuit and you go in there and you, you deal with all the little widgets that, that do do nifty things. And um, and they're busy building these components and they have these checklists associated with the components as they're going from workstation to workstation to workstation. And it's like, um, uh, I know what those checklists are. Those are those are risk management checklists. They're to make sure that no past problem that's ever occurred at that step in your process is present this this go round. That's what that is, right? I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what that is. And I came to learn that in the industry, um, those have names are called travelers or routers or check sheets, and um, it's a, it's a lean concept. And um, so, um, um, so fast forward again, uh, uh, ten years. Uh, here I'm teaching agile classes, and people come in for agile training, and they're like, uh, "We're here. We're here for quality. We're here to improve our quality," and. Uh, I remember thinking, uh, well, you know, okay, quality is great. Um, uh, I mean, sorry, agile is great. Like I, I love agile, but um, uh, agile is not a quality system. It's it's a way to maximize value and work together as a team, but it's not a quality system. Like I know what a quality system is. Like I've been through the fire. I, I know what that looks like. And that's not what, what agile is. And so um, I kept getting the same the same message. People would show up, teams would show up for agile training. We're here to improve our quality. And I'd be like, hmm. So um, other groups would come through agile training from operations and they would say, yeah, we're here to learn about agile and scrum, whatever. And at the end of the training, they'd say, well, you know, honestly, um, some of the stuff is applicable, but but not all of it. You know, for example, we're not sprinting anywhere. So that the whole idea of a sprint is kind of foreign to us. and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they're right. And so I kept hearing these messages and I kept hearing these messages and I kept hearing these messages. One day the light bulb went on and I realized there's a missing component in the industry. And um, we need a simple quality system that people can understand and, um, and establish and benefit from that doesn't require hiring a bunch of people, that doesn't require, you know, external audits, every year that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and you know there there are two other predominant quality systems in the software industry there's iso 9000 and one colon 2000 or something like that and there's uh, cmmi which people are more familiar with um, cmmi all of these do the same thing um, cmmi has a 125 point preset prescribed set of metrics that you have to monitor to to keep to get and keep your cmmi certification um, ISO 9000, you have to have auditors come in and um, spend three months with you every year, and it's very, very expensive. You're basically hiring people for, for a short time uh, to do all that every year. And that's all great if you want to do that. But stable um, 
produces the same benefit and it doesn't require either of those things. And so that's that's the beauty of stable. So I got busy and put together a framework that would work for uh, really any part of the IT industry. So um, stable is designed for development teams, is designed for operations teams, is designed for implementation teams, DevOps teams, DevSecOps teams. And uh, let's see, what have I what have I missed? Um, you know, it's funny, people ask about help desk and help desk kind of already operates under their own quality system. If you have a good help desk system, you know, where they're actually storing knowledge and retrieving it again, that's basically a quality system. So there's, there's really not a lot of application in help desk for stable. That's the only place I can think of because they're already covered. That's kind of the, uh, the introduction to stable and um, why, where stable came from. The CSA is a starting point for understanding the stable framework. There's actually two starting points for understanding the stable framework. This is one. The other is taking the certified stable process owner course. The CSPRO course day one is identical to the certified stable associate program. So either of these certifications are a starting point. So once you've had either of these certifications, you've learned the foundations of the stable framework and you qualify for any of the other stable certifications. The CSA is designed to be taken online, whereas the CSPRO is designed to be an in-class or live training experience. We're starting with a fun quote from W. Edwards Deming. Deming was a quality pioneer that made a big impact in the Japanese industries, electronics, and, and automobile manufacturing. Deming was one of the early quality pioneers that introduced a lot of quality concepts to Japan in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He helped the Japanese electronics industry dominate the world with their quality, and then the Japanese car industry dominate the world with quality. His quote is, if you are not continually improving yourself, how can you continually improve your environment? And of course, his quote, and this quote really captures the true spirit of improvement. Once you get bit by the improvement bug, you start to get interested in improving yourself, your environment, your family, your workplace, and everything you have the ability to improve. And that's the true nature of the word Kaizen, which you may have heard of already. It means a lot of things, and one of its meanings is improvement from within to without. I hope that the stable framework changes your life the way it's changed mine. All right, so let's get started. So every company everywhere is trying to achieve operational excellence, whether they have the vocabulary for it or not. Operational excellence is about two objectives. The first one is effectiveness, being able to nail what your customers want. The second is efficiency, being able to do it with minimal byproduct. So let's take a look at how Stable helps us with this objective. It helps first to understand how to define a business operation in one sentence. We do that by thinking of a business as a system. So a system has inputs, transformational throughputs, and outputs. With a business, the inputs are material or intellectual. And then inside the business, we add value to those material or intellectual inputs using internal capabilities. And we add enough value to those materials and intellectual inputs to produce a product or service a paying customer is interested in. So to put that into one sentence, a business is a system that takes material or intellectual inputs, adds value to them using internal capabilities to produce a product or service that a paying customer is interested in. Kind of helps us to define what we're dealing with going forward. And if you could take excellence and separate it into the two objectives I mentioned, they are effectiveness and efficiency. That's what everybody's trying to do. Another way to think about it is operational excellence is, is customer facing excellence and business process excellence. Customer facing excellence is how we nail what our customers are asking for, and uh, business process excellence is how we do it with minimal pie product. The agile mindset helps us with a customer facing excellence, helps us to deliver exactly what we're looking for, whereas a stable mindset helps us with the internal business process excellence. So um, here we're going to learn how to minimize waste, cost, time, materials, um, etc. using uh, the stable mindset. In other words, the stable mindset is about efficiency. The agile mindset is about effectiveness. So a little, con a little, so a little conversation about metrics. You really can't improve something substantially without measuring it. And often in our Western culture, we've grown up with metrics telling us how valuable we are as people. And so we tend to kind of be afraid of them. In order for businesses to improve, we, we really need to adopt a much more healthier attitude about metrics. You think of metrics as a way to start conversations. You know, if there's a, a problem somewhere and we have metrics that show that, 
uh, then that's a great place to start a conversation with, you know, how can we improve this weak metric? A uh, metric should be part of the, a business culture. You know, everybody involved should understand the most important metrics as value flows through an organization so that they can make decisions around what's most valuable to achieving those metrics. It's a good idea to have metrics visible. They should be talked about. They, they should evolve and change over time. That's really healthy. As you understand more about your business operations, it's very healthy to upgrade your metrics and evolve them as needed. Another concept that's important with operational excellence is that you want your metrics to display uh, on a dashboard or something so clearly that we call it the stranger off the street test. Could somebody come in off the street, look at your dashboard full of metrics and understand what they're looking at without having to ask anybody? So as stewards over any kind of team or group or any kind of business operation, we want to reach a point where we can articulate through metrics exactly what's going on in our environment without having to have our people that we report to chase us around all the time asking us how things are going in our department. And what we're really doing is doing them a big favor so that they their time is freed up to grow the business, which is what uh, senior executives should be focused on inside of a company. So you've heard me talk about the hidden factory and the hidden factory problem. Let's get a little bit more carefully. Here's a famous set of data that often shows up at software conferences. This is a data set that is uh, developed and published by the Standish Group, which is a Chicago-based consulting organization that was started by IBM. Back in 94, IBM thought it would be a good idea to start collecting software success rate data for the United States. And so they set up a group that later became the Standish Group that does this. Their, their, their charter is to go out and survey hundreds and thousands of companies and get a sense for um, how effective the software industry is as, uh, as time goes by. So looking at this information, you can see in 94 that um, only 16% of all the projects that they cataloged were considered successful. And it was a simple way to think of a successful project is that the scope, schedule, and cost were all um, met within, within reason. And so you see that 31% were complete failure. A failure means a complete throwaway write-off, complete loss of money and time and 53% were late. And in 96, the numbers went up a little bit. 27% were uh, called successful, and the late projects, see, went down a lot. Failed projects actually went up, so uh, maybe you could say it wasn't necessarily a successful time frame. 98, you see that, um, you know, the, the trends are all kind of similar. And around 2000 was where the people that came up with the Agile Manifesto got together. They, had, they, uh, they were a group of, of um, excellent, skilled, um, well-experienced well software professionals that had been writing books. They knew each other, and they decided to, to call a meeting together to talk about what was wrong with the software industry. They, they had seen this data set, and they, they knew that there were problems. And so in 2001, the Agile Manifesto and the birth of Agile came to the software industry. And so if you take a look at this chart, it, it's kind of nice because we now have 20 years of experience with Agile behind us. So we can look at metrics and see what kind of impact the Agile mindset has had on the software industry. And so if you were to um, tabulate the numbers on the left, versus the numbers on the right. If you kind of stare at it for a minute, maybe you'll pick up some trends if you stare at it for a minute. What you'll notice is if you tabulate these that the percent change of project success goes up about nine points. The percent change of project failure goes down about nine points. But the percent change of projects being late really doesn't change much at all. It changes about um, one and a half percentage points, which is not statistically significant. So in other words, what this concludes is that Agile has helped us uh, make um, more successful software that's been more acceptable to our customer base. And failed projects have gone down about the same percentage as successful projects going up about 9%. But late projects really has not been improved with the Agile movement. Now, that's not my opinion. That's what the data shows for itself. So it's important to understand that. Agile is great. It's been a huge improvement. But there's still some problems we have. And you could chalk up those problems to the hidden factory. The hidden factory is everything we have to do over again because it didn't go right the first time. And it's not even usually our fault. It, it could be um, other departments that give us bad information that change their minds. 
All these kinds of factors um, trigger hidden factory. Task switching, ambiguity, interruptions, incorrect input, delays, scrap, rework, all these kinds of things that we have to deal with that eat and erode our bandwidth of effectiveness as we work on our projects. So another principle that I think most people understand is that costs go up exponentially. A problem that enters your value stream that cascades a few steps down the value stream towards a customer gets exponentially more expensive to fix when it gets found. So one of the tricks to good quality system, and this is kind of what the Toyota quality system is all about, they figured out how to block problems from entering right where they would appear so they don't have to deal with them downstream. It doesn't mean they still don't have problems. It means that they have gotten good at blocking them where they would naturally appear so that they can detect the problem and not let it enter their production system. Well, you might think like I did initially that um, quality principles are great for manufacturing, but they really have no place in software development. I used to think that way until I came to understand that you could think of software as a manufacturing process of decisions. And once you think about it like that, suddenly it gives you a footing for applying manufacturing quality principles. A lot of people would be surprised to know that Scrum actually has its roots in lean and quality manufacturing. There's just more there that we can use, and that's what the stable framework is. It's kind of, if you will, the second wave of great concepts and techniques from the lean environment that we can bring to software development. So let's now talk about the benefits of a quality framework. There are two primary approaches to managing quality in an IT environment. The first one is you hire good people and you pressure them to get it right. And um, based on my experience talking to literally hundreds of companies about their success with this approach, I'd say that this usually ends up with about a 35% hidden factory problem, where one out of three hours, everybody in your team is busy redoing things over again that didn't go right the first time. Maybe it's better in your company. The second approach is you actually adopt a real systematized quality program, like ISO 9000 or CMMI or the Stable Framework. Here is some data showed by Boeing back in the 80s as they adopted CMMI. And one of the interesting things about this data set is this predates Agile. So you can see the benefits of a quality system in an IT environment all by itself before Agile was around. And so we have here their level one of their project success rates, and they publish this. This is public data they published. There's a website there where you can see the link to this information. You can see that in the beginning, when they were sort of pre-adoption of a quality framework, they measured their project success rates, and, and they varied from being 22% early to about 148% late. And um, so that was kind of their baseline to begin with. As they started adopting the various stages of CMMI, you could see how the quality improved. So as they got a little bit into it, the variation changed from you know, 22 to, to negative 148 to, to 26, which is even better. They were finishing some of their projects even faster. And the variation was negative 125, which was you know only 125% beyond their schedule target. And then as they got to level three of CMMI, which is basically where you have systematized your environment, their range was much improved. So they were finishing 20% early to uh, you know negative uh, 24% late. And then as they started being able to apply continual improvement to their defined processes, they were able to improve that even more. You can see where they ended up in the end, getting a variation of just you know plus four uh, percent, minus seven percent, which is extremely attractive. So let's take a look at uh, CMMI. And I mentioned that um, all these quality frameworks are very similar. They, they work very similarly and, and produce um, very similar results. So level one is basically where um, you have a software development team. That's sort of level one. There's a manager, but there's really no real governance process in place. Level two is where it's, it's managed, but not with a quality framework. You know, you've got some accountability for project end dates and uh, maybe a few metrics are sort of being applied, but not formally. Uh, level three is where you've actually systematized your environment. You've defined your processes, you have metrics around them, 
And that's a, a huge improvement. As you remember, the third level of CMMI that Boeing was appreciating, you know, their variation improved tremendously. Level four is where you have mechanisms in place to preserve institutional knowledge and add to that knowledge. And, and level five is where you have some history of improving those steps that have been systematized. And that's where we want to get to is level five. And I'm just mentioning that ISO works very much like this. So does stable. They're all they're very similar. So let's look at some of the other benefits that Boeing reported after adopting a quality framework. They had formal gate reviews as they went from the requirements process to the design process to the coding process and to the testing process. And before they were having formal gate reviews where they had like checklists where they were watching for what was, you know, what was done and not done. It says here that they were able to improve the rework and then get rid of 31% of it, which was a huge improvement by having uh, formal gate reviews where they were looking at checklists full of information as uh, did we do this or not? Did we remember to do that or not? Also, the total number of defects per year decreased. And so here they were um, going from level three, level four, level five. You see such a large organization took took so long to improve. Um, and that's what I, my, my point was about these other um, performance management frameworks is they take a long time to uh, make a, a improvements with and um, to adopt. And so here we have um, in 97, um, total post-release defects, total post, uh, let's see, total pre-release defects is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the brownish yellow, and then post-release defects is the green. So you see that um, um, as they adopted these level three, four, and five, that um, their, um, their post-release defects shrunk tremendously. Look at that green, it's very, very small compared to before. And then uh, pre-release defects also shrunk. They were found and shrunk. So there's um, a huge improvement there. Also, the cost of defect savings went up. So here they were defect prevention cost savings. So they were showing that uh, they were not making any grounds at all until they hit level three and then they started making some big improvements. Level four, five savings went up tremendously. And then cycle time, they were able to deal with customer responses 64% faster see as they went from level three four and five and again level three is where you've systematized your environment level four is where you have a mechanism in place to continually improve and level five is after you've made some substantial continual improvements and so the cycle time um, shrank for them to um, be able to address their customers needs so that's a huge benefit and uh, i think this is the last slide of their of their um, reporting group this is really important so before they um, embarked on their quality effort this is employee satisfaction you can see that the the mean report was about 5.7 and after the quality system was in place you see it's almost nine so it went up almost 50 percent which is huge. What this means is that the employees that were actually practicing the quality framework, once they understood how to put it in place and, and implement it, they were happier coming to work significantly, 50% happier. That's a really, really big deal. So let's talk about the basics of a quality system. A quality system can be thought of as five different parts. Quality planning, which is the initial setup of a quality system. And let me just say that a quality system is bigger than any one single employee. It really requires management, understanding, and buy-in to set it up properly. And then the basic components most people have heard of are quality control and quality assurance. There's a third component also called initial quality assessment. Quality control is product quality. Think of it as the output from the process. So, for example, in software, that would be the build that we're going to test to see if it passes the test so that we can promote it to production. Quality assurance is in-process quality. So that is proof that we're building it correctly. In IT, you could think of that as a code review, which you've probably heard of before. Component design review, which would be like screens and reports. Uh, an architecture review, requirements review. All of that is quality assurance. Incoming quality assessment is a starting point for a step within the process. So. Let's say you're at step two or three or four of a four-step process. You want to make sure that the business products you receive are what they are intended to be before you start working on them. Another way to think of that is a certificate-based workflow. So at all the different repeatable steps along the value stream, each individual repeatable step would follow this pattern. 
incoming quality assessment, quality assurance, quality control. And that's really the secret to what we call prevention over inspection. So everybody's familiar with inspecting a candidate deliverable before it's ready to give to a customer, but there's a higher form of quality called prevention where we actually block would-be problems from entering our value stream wherever they would normally enter. This concept is very powerful, prevention over inspection, and that's what separates the Toyota quality system from other car companies that didn't figure out that concept. The fifth and last part of a quality system is continual improvement. So once you've defined your process, identified your repeatable steps, put a quality system like this around each one of the repeatable steps, now you have a platform you can continually improve. And we continually improve our quality platform through updating standard operating procedures, risk checklists, recovery models, and any other lessons learned. And this is the basic structure that all these quality systems have. It's fun to talk about the history of formal quality management. One of the big uh, revelations I had consuming all the history of uh, quality management was that um, the quality principles we have today were really based on um, previous quality practices that were based on previous quality practices uh, really for the last several hundred years. Nobody sat in their basement and came up with the, the quality standards that we have today by themselves. The, um, the first person to have ever been written about as being concerned about quality was a guy named Jean-Baptiste Vaquet de Gribival. I'm sure I slaughtered his name, I apologize. He was a cannon maker who made cannons for Napoleon's armies. He actually lived a little bit before Napoleon, but um, his ideas made, made for cannons with interchangeable parts. Napoleon's armies were the first group to have cannons that had interchangeable parts. This was a radical idea. Before this time, cannons were um, kind of one-offs, like um, cannons were all made differently and, and they were uh, one-off you know, works of art and wonder. And so Jean-Baptiste came up with this idea that if they were interchangeable part cannons, that you could take several broken cannons on a battlefield and you could uh, cannibalize and reassemble them into um, working um, products, which is what he did. And it worked. It was a pretty good idea. This is one of the advantages that uh, Napoleon had was uh, he had better cannons. And so uh, later a gentleman named Henri Blanc was a gunsmith and made muskets. And he um, took a look at that and decided that it would be an interesting idea to try to make muskets with interchangeable parts. And he was successful at doing that. He was the first one successful at doing that. So he brought his concept to the French authorities and asked them if they were interested in supporting his idea of... Um, of making interchangeable part muskets and they were not interested they didn't want to fend the guilds out there of uh, all the different people that were making muskets by hand and so they they just uh, didn't support the idea but thomas jefferson who was an ambassador to france happened to see one of these demos and he thought it was a wonderful idea he asked Henri Blanc if he wanted to move to America and make interchangeable part muskets and Henri Blanc was not interested in that. So Thomas Jefferson got on the boat and went back to the States and talked to George Washington who was the president at the time and said hey I saw this really cool idea interchangeable part muskets why don't we make these ourselves instead of buying arms from um, our nation neighbors and uh, George Washington thought it was a great idea. So Thomas Jefferson and George Washington decided they needed to find somebody who could make muskets in this manner with interchangeable parts. And they got a hold of Eli Whitney, who was the inventor of the cotton gin. And he said, yeah, I'll make these muskets for you. And so he took the money and uh, 12 years later showed up with 12,000 muskets, which is what they had ordered from him. So Eli Whitney had a son that was friends with a, a gentleman named Samuel Colt. And Samuel Colt was a real troublemaker. When he was in high school, apparently he um, caught his high school on fire and uh, was, um, was sent away as a result of that. And on that trip, he boarded a riverboat and um, was watching the paddle wheel on the, the back of the riverboat and got this idea of making a, a, a cylinder and a pistol that would, you know, um, shoot multiple times. And so he was able, with Eli Whitney's son, to create the Colt's the Colt Arms Company and to make uh, the first revolvers. And so he sold these revolvers to the Texas Rangers and the U.S. Army and was very successful doing that. It turns out that Henry Ford knew Samuel Colt. And so Henry Ford thought this was a really interesting idea to mass produce things on an assembly line. 
and um, so he started making cars in this manner and some some really interesting things happened as a result of that Henry Ford arbitrarily picked a eight-hour workday five days a week and that's where the middle class came from in America and he mass-produced a lot of cars and one of the problems they had was they would make a car and it would not necessarily work and so they decided it was a good idea to inspect the cars before the customers came to pick them up and you know they'd find problems sometimes and so those problems would fall into two categories they'd either have to rework the problem or scrap the the, the problem and uh, go get a whole nother part to be replaced in the car when it wouldn't work but you know it took time to do that and it took time to take the cars apart a little bit and fix them and put them back together so this was uh, kind of the uh, evolution of quality to the point that we call inspection today i'm um, taking a finished product and making sure it's what it's supposed to be for the customer comes and picks it up. Well around this time in the 1920s there was a statistician that worked for one of the companies that made products for um, the first telephone company and this statistician's name was Walter Schuhart and Walter Schuhart was uh, a master statistician that invented a, a bunch of technology that we use today. He was kind of an older guy he sort of wrote a book and died and that was his legacy but he had two understudies one who worked for him and, and one that didn't but just knew him and the understudies were Joseph Duran and um, Edward Deming. And um, uh, Deming uh, took his ideas of statistical process control and systems thinking and applied them to, to management and, and tried to help the management in different companies understand that um, they could improve their processes a lot if they would uh, adopt these quality principles. He wasn't very successful as a salesperson and ended up um, not being very successful as he approached the American car companies. Joseph Duran had a little bit better success. He ended up working for Henry Ford, created a process called Total Quality Management, which is where kind of the thinking that um, everybody's responsible for quality, that's kind of how they, they had um, thought of Total Quality Management. Well, um, eventually Deming uh, got asked to go help the U.S. Army do census work in Japan after World War II. So he took the idea of systems thinking and statistical process control that he had learned from Walter Schuhart. He took that to Japan with him. And while he was there, he talked to some of the senior Japanese government officials about his ideas. And they thought his ideas were really interesting. And so they asked him to go on the university talk circuit, and so he did. He went and, and um, went around the university talk circuits in Japan, and guess who was in the audience listening to him? Engineers from um, Panasonic, Sony, Toyota, Honda, uh, Subaru, all these Japanese companies. And they loved his ideas. They asked him if he would stay in Japan and help them rebuild their factories with his ideas. He loved being asked that. He said, sure, absolutely. And he stayed there 25 years and helped uh, the Japanese um, understand the quality principles so they could make superior products for less money and quicker. While in Japan, several other concepts were developed. Um, the mistake-proofing concept, the Japanese called pokeyoka, which is basically um, sort of dummy-proofing something so that um, there's, there's no way to fail as you're moving it from one workstation to the next. And also some other uh, techniques evolved there, something really important called the Kaizen culture. Kaizen is a Japanese word for improvement, but it doesn't mean disruptive improvement it means polish it means taking something good and making it a little bit better and that's kind of the nature of kaizen after having a lot of success in japan you know the world started changing and the japanese electronics dominated the the world market kind of quietly in the next decade japanese cars started to last quite a bit longer than american cars and and everybody could see that happening uh, back at Toyota, they had taken all these ideas and called them the Toyota Production System, or Toyota Quality System is called sometimes. This is kind of the um, epitome of uh, quality, uh, world-class quality today. They had a consultant named Shiro Shingho that um, they paid to put all these ideas into some courseware and teach it to all the Toyota employees. So he spent a few years doing that, and when his contract was up, he took his material to Mitsubishi and showed them how to make super tankers in half the time and for a lot less money. And um, then he got this crazy idea and had his books translated into English. And um, that's when it became apparent to the rest of the world what was actually going on. And uh, today we call that lean. And so if you've ever heard the term lean, lean manufacturing, that's really the Toyota quality system that's been um, translated and adopted by um, other companies elsewhere.
All right, so that's a, a brief history of quality and where Lean came from. So I'm now going to introduce you to the stable framework. There are seven points to the stable framework. The first one is a process asset library. This is a central repository where we store knowledge. You cannot improve as a company unless you're storing knowledge. And that means transferring it from tribal knowledge into institutional knowledge. Two roles. This is what makes it all happen. There's the master chief, who is kind of like the senior quality person in the organization or in the department. And then everybody else are process owners that are performing repeatable steps that they do every day. Three domains, past, present, and future. This is how we organize information. So some information we'll need in the future, and that's where it is. Some we'll need right now because that's the current workflow that we're working on. And then there's past information, which is really our metrics. Four meetings within a time box. This is the Scrum model. So it's stable, but you'll notice it's the Scrum model. Just like a lot of other frameworks are based off of Scrum, so is stable. The five principles. So these are five principles we'll look at to govern our decision making with improvement. Six forms of process improvement. So we'll talk about six ways to actually improve a process. And then seven steps for systematization. So this is how you actually implement stable in an environment. And these are the seven parts to the stable framework. The process asset library is where you store all your institutional knowledge. It's a central repository where um, all the information goes and where um, as uh, time goes on and your governance process improves and improves you'll be making um, physical improvements to this process asset library. It's comprised of a service register which is really just a list of all of the um, value propositions inside your department and a process asset matrix that links the different assets in your environment with the different processes. Um, the process control section and an asset control section. Think of process controls as um, just sort of a list of all the different repeatable processes inside your, your environment and the same with asset controls. It's really just a place to hang information about these repeatable processes or these assets that are part of the repeatable processes. So we have a list of all the value propositions we're responsible for in our environment. Uh, this list is a, a list of master services. Think of those as everything that we're responsible for uh, making sure happens. Pending services, which are projects that are in development right now. Tired services, which are um, services that we don't advertise anymore. Maybe we have some legacy customers that still consume these services and eventually we're going to sunset them. And then supplier services. These are services that we rely upon to do our job. Service register is a central place where we can list all of them so that we can um, start to collect metrics on them. Process asset matrix is uh, where our assets that are used for each of the different repeatable processes are listed with those repeatable processes. So this gives us a sense of which assets are used for different processes. Process controls are where we store information about our repeatable processes and asset controls are where we store information about our assets that we use. Process controls include process steps for each service offered. You could think of those as like standard operating procedures. Kata cards for each repeatable process step. So kata cards in stable are risk management checklists. Think of a kata as a repeatable process you do over and over again trying to get better at. And so a kata card is the checklist that governs that process. And it's not a checklist of how to do it. It's, it's Instead, it's a checklist of problems that have occurred at that step that we have known about from past experience. And the idea is that the process owner that is um, uh, performing that step um, has got this list in front of them of things to watch out for and, and be sure to check for. Recovery models are uh, information about um, what's gone wrong with that step in the past and how to fix it. Um, it's really more applicable for assets. So, um, you know, what's what's gone wrong with the server in the past? What were the, you know, what was the root cause? What were the symptoms? And uh, and how to recover from it? And these these start off sort of empty or blank. And as we have real problems with these assets, we um, we add information to them. So as time goes on, our uh, process owners are trained to go straight to the recovery models and look for you know past problems that have happened with that. Um, particular um, asset or in some cases that particular process step. Usually the checklists themselves, the Kata cards govern the actual process steps and the recovery models are more useful for asset controls. Two roles, the master chief and uh, the process owners. 
So the master chief you could think of as sort of owning the whole system. One of the biggest challenges in quality management today, you can go to any large company and talk to the quality manager and they will tell you the same thing, all these big companies. They will say, the biggest challenge with quality management is that nobody listens to the quality manager. So in Stable, we solve that problem by making the senior person in the department or the group the master chief. So for example, in development, that would be the dev manager. In operations, that would be the ops manager. In DevOps, that would be the DevOps manager. Um, in implementation, it would be the implementation manager. And so um, they uh, hold the role of master chief. Everybody else is a process owner. So what's the master chief responsible for? Well, um, clarifying objectives and constraints, coordinating all the processes, coaching team members to success with stable, encouraging relationships between the process owners, the uh, customers, and the suppliers. So it's not just about getting closer to your customers, but it's also about getting closer to your upstream suppliers that give you your, your, your business packages so that you can help them help you be more capable at your job. Uh, they also arrange for collection of customer satisfaction data and net promoter score information. So I'm sure you've heard of customer satisfaction data before. Net Promoter Scores is um, a way to measure how inclined your customers are to recommend your product or service to an associate. And there's a formula for calculating that, but that's what it is. And so the Master Chief's responsible basically for getting feedback from the customers. And they don't necessarily have to do this themselves, but they have to make sure that there's a conduit out there. They should not use the process owners for that. And they should find another way to do it, maybe through marketing department or the help desk department, or um, maybe I'm um, having somebody assigned to do outside calls or something like that. And there's a concept talked about in the stable framework book about the milkshake principle. Basically, you don't want the person responsible for the data being the same person collecting it. And that's the milkshake principle. There's a story behind it in the book. And also the, the most important um, role of the master chief is to be the final point of accountability. So at the end of all these value streams, as a product is released, the uh, master chief has to sign off on the um, product being uh, ready to be released. And they have confidence when they do this because they're handed a stack of upstream kata cards that have all been signed by all the process owners doing the previous steps up and, and prepared for that software release or, or whatever it is. And so think of it as a certificate-based workflow where everybody involved has the assurance that everybody preceding them has done their job with the utmost standard of, of care and knowledge taken when they perform that step. It's kind of like when you go into a hospital and they, they have this term called a standard of care. That means that if you walk in with, you know, sore throat symptoms or something, you're going to get the same standard of care no matter which hospital you go to. They're going to give you uh, maybe a COVID test, maybe a flu test or something. And depending on what they find, they're going to prescribe something for you. And that's called a certain standard of care, like a level of care. Well, it's the same kind of thing. As process owners are performing their repeatable processes, they're also ensuring that none of the past problems that have been detected in this particular step are present right now. And that's how we're able to prevent problems from entering in a value stream like Toyota does. All right, the second um, role is the process owner. And they're responsible for, you know, everything else. Process owners, finally, they're responsible for the success of the processes that they have stewardship over. And so with the Master Chief, they could come up with service level agreements or service level goals for their uh, customer facing activities. And they're also responsible for customer relationships, supplier relationships, and customer satisfaction scores. I mentioned that the three domains in Stable um, cater to information, uh, how we store information. The future domain is information we'll need later. Uh, past domain are our metrics, and the present domain are our workflow. And all of this information comes together on something called a, a performance console. You could think of a performance console as an information radiator, and uh, that's, that's how we uh, understand what's going on in our environment. The future domain contains these things, service register, um, process controls, and asset controls, which we talked about already. System schedule, which just governs trigger points for when certain things need to happen within the environment. And a system backlog. And so this is a combination of scheduled activities that come from the system schedule, customer requests, which come from the business, asset maintenance, which might come from needs of your assets, 
and then a kappa Q. So the kappa is a correction, corrective action, preventative action committee. And this is a committee that should exist that is championed by the help desk. And the help desk group would meet with the department chairs, the dev department, the operations department, and the implementation department chairs and feed information to them about any recurring problems that are happening in the help desk and also the the latest news from the street on releases that have just gone out and so that kappa committee would meet maybe once a, a sprint or a cycle in stable we call them cycles master cycles once or uh, or maybe if you have a release just went out the door maybe you want to have that committee meeting three days in a row or something while the the, um, the new release has just gone out. The system configuration is set up by the Master Chief as uh, it becomes a location where all this information can go that the department will use. Um, part of what's in there, you'd have your standard operating procedures for your repeatable steps or your katas, um, asset recovery models, and then templates also for um, these, uh, these katas. We call them kata card templates. And so here's a simple uh, SIPOC model. The SIPOC stands for suppliers, inputs, processes, outputs, and components. Combined, this is a nice way to kind of describe what's going on for a particular process. You could make one of these for the whole value stream, or you could also make one of these for each of the repeatable steps within a value stream. They're kind of two, two levels of, uh, of, of examining a value stream. System schedule is just organized by um, frequency, how often things should happen. System backlog, we talked about already. And then the present domain. So the present domain is the workflow happening right now. And so um, this is a combination of a daily Kaizen stand-up meeting. So in stable, we call them Kaizen stand-up meetings. They're very similar to sprint stand-up meetings. We just add a fourth question to the three standard Scrum stand-up questions. The fourth question is, what have I improved since yesterday? And also, at the end of a stable Kaizen meeting, everybody sits back down and for 10 minutes they're challenged to improve their environment for the next 10 minutes. Straighten up their desk, go through some email and, and clean it out, you know, uh, straighten up the, the, the stapler, the conference room, whatever, wipe the fingerprints off the door if, if they can't think of anything else to do. So it's just 10 minutes of cleanliness every day after stand-up meeting. The Toyota group learned something that they did not expect to learn. They, they learned that in clean environments that their employees could make better decisions faster. So think about that for a minute. Remember how we talked about software being an assembly line of, of decisions? Toyota found their people can make better decisions faster in a clean environment. All right, so we want a clean environment. And we call that process the 5S housekeeping. You'll see that in a little bit, that whole uh, cleaning process. Ad hoc Kaizen teams. So part of what's encouraged in the stable is is asking for help. If you have help with some kind of technical problem, instead of working on it for five days without asking anybody, we think it's a better idea to ask for some volunteer assistance. And we've also learned it's important for the assistance to be volunteered, not assigned. Volunteer assistance seems much more powerful than assigned assistance. That's what an ad hoc Kaizen team is, a really brief team of two or maybe three people for half a day or a day or maybe two to get past a technical hurdle. Process katas and kata cards, we talked about those. And training and retraining. So initially, part of a quality framework is you have to log the learning process for everybody involved. So as part of quality planning, the Master Chief has to have a log of, of everybody and that they initially got trained on where the process asset library is, what the standard operating procedures are, and how to use a stable. And so what happens is, in, in practice, as uh, people start using the system and implementing the system, if there's ever a discrepancy, if somebody says they checked for something and um, it uh, somehow they, they didn't check correctly or the product goes out the door and maybe a customer finds a defect that was one of the checklist items on a, on a Kata card. What happens then is the, the Master Chief has that particular process owner for sort of missing that step. What they have to do is they have to go through retraining. Retraining means that they have to make sure that the standard operating procedure and the Kata card checklist is up to date and accurate for that particular step. And so that's what the, the training and retraining process is all about. And then the Master Chief keeps in their log that somebody was retrained at, at this point. 
committees. So there's a change control committee that um, you should already be familiar with. That's a standard um, practice in, um, in IT organizations. And then a CAPA committee, which I talked about already. That's the, the committee that is championed by the help desk group. Um, an alert system within the environment, that's always a good idea. Production change log, uh, so that we know when different changes are made to production. You know, sometimes something strange will get detected and the logs will show it started two weeks ago on Tuesday and you can go look in the production change log and say, what do we do Tuesday? Oh, Tuesday we released the new telecom system. Okay, well, maybe they're related to each other. And so that's what the production change log is. A suggestion box is also a great idea in a stable environment. A suggestion box helps your people feel like they're heard. And um, as part of the daily Kaizen stand-up meeting, the Master Chief reads the uh, comments from the suggestion box to the, the team um, every morning. And then you'd have a sprint board if your team is um, constructing some. Otherwise, you'd have a Kanban board if your team is not really constructing anything. They're just maintaining things. Or if you're in an environment that does both, most um, development teams actually do both. They have their, their project efforts, which could be on a sprint board if they're doing Scrum. But then they have daily production change requests, which is a common feature in uh, production environments. And so that could be managed on a, a Kanban board. And of course, your, uh, your Kata cards. So here's a simple Kanban board. Yours might look different. Um, objectives, tasks to do, and process, and done. The six is a standard um, feature in a Kanban board where you're identifying a bottleneck. You don't want any more than six items within this particular column. And this would probably be the slowest column and you're trying to keep people from task switching and, and draining even more of their efforts as a result of, of uh, task switching. So keeping a number here, limiting it to six items, keeps the queue upstream where it belongs and not on the developer's desks. You know, people lose a lot of time to just task switching that is unnecessary. And that's what these, these numbers mean. So a uh, Kanban board can show you work in process or in progress, as some people say, and, and you know, it'll expose your bottlenecks. So let's take a look at a Kata card. This is a Kata card that you'll see in the book. And uh, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that there's um, several things going on here. One looks like we have a code build happening. And uh, if you read it carefully, you'll see that there, the steps here are, are very carefully to uh, delete the target directories and then recreate them and copy the uh, candidates release into the target directories and then notify testing that it's ready. And then the second part of the Kata card is a second step for the testers to test the product and indicate if it meets all the criteria on the Kata card. So the idea is that you'd have uh, a Kata card like this for your repeatable steps in development or wherever you are. You could think of development repeatable steps. You could think of um, if you're doing um, sort of a non-agile approach, an easy way to think of it is the V model. You'd have a requirements process as a repeatable step. The architecture process is a repeatable step. The component design process is a repeatable step. The screens and reports. And then the coding process is a repeatable step. Build process is a repeatable step. Testing process is a repeatable step. And moving from uh, test to uh, production also is a repeatable step. So you could create, you think of each of those as a kata and have a, an SOP and a kata card for each one of those repeatable steps. There are additional repeatable steps in, in development. There's, you know, new employee onboarding is a repeatable step. Setting up a programmer workstation is a repeatable step. Offboarding is a repeatable step. Uh, I remember one, one place I worked where we implemented Stable, I was offboarding an employee who'd been there for a while, and I asked her if she had any feedback for me and, you know, the company in general. And she said, yeah, she said, you know, I worked here for seven months not knowing there was a restroom right down that hallway. I was going into the other building um, for seven months to use the restroom not knowing there was one right there. It would have been nice to have been shown where the restrooms are. And as a new employee. And so you know what I did? I pulled out my employee onboarding Kata card and I added a checklist item that said, you know, be sure to show them where the restrooms are. Point on, every new employee got to see where the restrooms were. So you see how this works? Very systematized. Right, notice that a Kata card also has signatures on it. You want to make sure that to whoever checked it off, signed it, and now that's your certificate that the work was performed correctly that goes to the next person down the value stream. Think of these as um, certificates in a certificate-based workflow. That's the idea. So there's an approach to creating a Kata card for pre-existing repeatable work. 
and to the model is called standardized do check act. What that means is you create the standard operating procedure as carefully as you can. By the way, if uh, you can today use AI to create standard operating procedures, it really takes the, the pain out of doing it. Uh, Chat GPT will create fantastic SOPs for you. You start off with maybe something like that to begin with. Then you actually perform the repeatable step or have your process owner perform the repeatable step. That's the do. Then the check is they're checking to see what you missed. So what else should the SOP contain that's not there? And then act as you add on to the SOP or change it as necessary. And you keep doing that until the SOP reflects the actual work being done. And then that SOP is, is sort of finished for now and uh, you can get on to another one. So that's a quick way to create SOPs for your environment. The three committees I talked about, two of them, there's three total. CAPA committee I talked about, you know, really is a champion by the help desk. Change control committee, which is should be department wide and then a quarterly business review meeting. So this is something that really the uh, usually just Master Chief goes to. This is kind of their, their quarterly business review that most companies have with senior management. Part of that is they're reporting on maybe their balance scorecard or something like that. Part of what they can bring to the table in that meeting is a chart showing how things are going in a stable environment. And we'll, we'll show you what those charts look like. So yeah, here, here they are. And we have our master cycle totals. Think of a master cycle as a sprint. It's just we don't call it a sprint because in some cases we're not sprinting like in operations or DevOps, DevSecOps. We're not sprinting anywhere. We're just maintaining the service and we're doing it over time. So we call those cycles instead of sprints if you're not a development team. But it's the same principles apply. Master cycle totals. So here are different charts that we can show in our past domain. Cumulative system performance chart. This is sort of a roll up of how everything is going in our area. This is something we would bring to that quarterly business review if we're a master chief. Supplier services slam chart. Okay, so a slam chart is a service level um, attainment monitoring chart. This helps us understand if we're meeting our service levels or not every single day. Supplier services are the services we rely on to get our job done. So like incoming internet, um, network support, you know, there's not a lot of them, but just a few of them, but they're critical. Uh, power maybe. Cycle totals. So at the end of each cycle, think of a cycle as a sprint. At the end of each cycle, you know, how much uh, uh, work did we complete and, and that kind of stuff. Customer satisfaction scores, net promoter scores, I talked about those already, and then slam charts for individual um, services that we're responsible for offering. And then there's some historical data that gets collected. An incident register uh, for just um, problems. Production change log. Critical decision log is also a good idea. When do we make critical decisions regarding services? Kata card historical repository. So as a master chief, the Kata cards get collected and stored. That's important. Sometimes you'll have a failure out in uh, production and you know it's a known problem. And so it's like, okay, who missed that on a checklist? And so you can go back and determine who worked that particular checklist. And sometimes a process owner um, missed something and so you know, they get retraining if they miss something, especially in the beginning until people kind of get the hang of it. Cotter Card Historical Repository, okay, talked about that. CSP Repository, that's your Cumulative System Performance Historical Repository. This is your, your kind of roll-up chart uh, for how everything is going, and we store those historically. So over time, we can see how much improvement we've made across the board. And then, of course, the training log, which I've talked about already. So these are some examples of what those... Um, reports would be for the past domain. The cycle totals, how much work did you get done? You could slice this up any way you want to. <clears throat> critical, non-critical, strategic, non-strategic, um, etc. Moscow is a prioritization technique. Must, should, could, won't. Um, for um, any way you want to classify uh, what's what's important to do and not so important. Time allocations, if this is something you want to collect or need to collect, where are we spending our time in the department? And that's a Pareto chart showing us the most frequent reasons why our time is devoted down to the least frequent use of our time. And then this, this red line here, if you've never seen a Pareto chart before, shows the accumulating percentage. So in other words, you could say this first repeating uh, need, this database adjustment is about 20% uh, of our overall time spent. And then these two are about 30 or 40% of our time spent. These three are about 50% of our time spent on down. And so the quality pioneers taught us to think about the critical few. And so we should be spending the majority of our time trying to figure out ways to automate these critically few time drains rather than spend a lot of time on these, these little ones, or rather than spending an equal amount of time trying to solve all these problems. All of those are a mistake. We really should be focusing on the critical few.
Okay, so there's uh, also a formula for measuring uh, customer satisfaction that uh, was developed in the 80s. It's a, a way of looking at customer satisfaction five different um, domains. Reliability, assurance, tangibles, empathy, and responsiveness. So reliability is how well did the actual product or service perform its, uh, its supposed role. Assurance is um, how much confidence did the customer have in the company, your company, that's offering the service. Tangibles, how well did the look and feel impress the customer? Empathy, uh, so do the customers feel a connection to your salespeople and to other employees in your company? And then responsiveness, how well in is your, do they feel your company is to help them with their issues? So that's the serve qual model. And here's the formula for doing a net promoter score survey. Remember, this is the measuring the probability of a customer to recommend your service. So what you do is you ask them on a scale of 0 to 10 how likely they are to recommend your company. And what you do is you add up the people that scored 9 and 10, and you ignore the 7 and 8s, and you add up the number of people that scored from 0 to 6. And you subtract the, the detractors, the 0 to 6 count, from the promoters, the 9 to 10 count. And what you have left is your net promoter score. And so um, it's important, if you can, to get at least 30 survey results. That's really important. So well, that's how you calculate a net promoter score. So here's the incident register. So there's really two things we, we store on an incident register. The first is incidences that actually were problematic that um, had us experiencing an actual problem that required scrap or rework. And that's all really the, the, the chaos that you operate inside of. And then um, here we have um, times where our quality framework uh, protected us from downstream problems. And so it's interesting over time to calculate how many problems that we actually have versus how many did our quality system save us from. And then you get a sense of, um, of how you're doing going forward, you know, that we're making progress. If this number becomes a lot bigger than this number, we're, we're improving. Yeah, it's a way to track it over time, incident register. The SLAM chart I talked about briefly, this is the service level attainment monitoring chart. And so there are different versions of this chart, but what we do is we basically take like the number of days in a month or maybe a, a sprint if you or a, or a cycle if you want to do it that way. And we list our services that we're watching and then we're tracking here, did we meet our service level or did we breach our service level? And so the, the dots all indicate we met our service levels and the numbers indicate there was a breach these particular days with these particular services. So down here on the notes, we're, we're keeping track of what the reason was for each of these incidences, and they're listed here so that all can see and so that we can um, get better going forward at making sure these problems disappear. Another metric you can track is team morale. This is a really good idea. How do you track team morale? You ask your team and uh, create a survey. Um, they could even help out with, with questions for the survey, and then you just uh, publish the results every sprint. Also, you could publish the uh, project statuses that are usually happening in a IT department anyway. And so here's a kind of a fun chart. Sometimes people call these stoplight charts. So it's showing the overall status of the project, you know, like red, green, or yellow. Um, red is a project that's like way late or something. Yellow is it's within 20%, and then green represents it's on track. Um, here's something fun too. You could have um, the bubble lane. Maybe the lane shows the percentage complete of the project. Maybe the, the size of the bubble is the team size or something like that. You can make it represent different things. Here's a product performance report. So this is something that could come from marketing or from operations. These are products that are already out there and we get some market data here, kind of market size and units sold, revenue per unit, total unit revenue, percent market share, percent market share change since last uh, measuring or last quarter or something like that, customer satisfaction score, etc. So depending on um, who in your um, company would be doing something like this, maybe product manager or something like that. Here's the services performance report. So of all the services we offer, um, you're looking at um, different numbers here that indicate like where our service levels met, what's our customer satisfaction rating, and then we have um, these little spark lines here that show the numbers but in a graph format so they're kind of easy to look at. Notice this is an annual chart here. So this is something that the Master Chief would, would put together from all the data that is collected. And they would bring this chart to their uh, quarterly business review and kind of report up uh, on how 
everything's going in that department. And so all this gets uh, put together on a big dashboard called the Performance Console. Um, that's how to manage your data in Stable. Here's a comment from Alistair Coburn, um, one of the, the, the founder of the Agile uh, Crystal Method and uh, one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto. And the, he coined the term information radiator. He said it's a large and easily visible to the casual understood user, understood at a glance, changes periodically, is easily kept up to date, and usually informs non-delivery team members of what's going on. Remember, your job as a professional is to be able to express how things are going on and whatever you're given stewardship over so that the people that you report to can just look and see how things are going and not have to chase you around asking you all the time. You want to get to that point. That frees up their time so they can spend it growing the business. Okay, so four meetings within a repeating time box. So this is um, the four meetings in Stable are set up like Scrum because Scrum is a proven model that works. We have a master cycle planning meeting at the start of a cycle. We have a daily Kaizen stand-up. At the end of the cycle, we have a cycle review meeting and a cycle retrospective. Cycle review is with any management that wants to attend and the cycle retrospective is just with our teams. And uh, with our team, we're, we're just uh, reflecting on what went well this last cycle, what could be improved. And, and the third question in a stable cycle retrospective meeting is what still feeds the hidden factory. Here's some guidance for selecting uh, the length of a cycle. If you have a development team doing sprints, probably the simplest thing to do is make your cycle length um, the same as theirs. And you guys could even report together at the same meetings. Shorter cycles are better if there's high uncertainty easy to get feedback, priorities change a lot. If not, longer cycles might be a little bit easier if there's low uncertainty and it's kind of, or it is difficult to get feedback and priorities ch rarely change or urgency emerges slow, you can probably enjoy a little bit longer cycles. I mentioned it's a good technique if you have um, a project team that also has a lot of daily production change requests to use a sprint board and a Kanban board. Sprint board to deal with the project activities and Scrum and the Kanban board to deal with all the production change requests. And then you can timestamp items as they move along the uh, Kanban board so you get a sense of about how long it takes to do what type of, of requests. And then you can organize the requests into similar types and then you'll have some intelligence on about how long it takes to expedite different types of requests within your environment. Starting a master cycle. So the cycle planning meeting. <clears throat> The master chief and the team uh, load objectives on column with what has to be done that particular cycle. Now, most operations groups, there already is known work to do. This is just if there's anything above and beyond what's on the normal list of work to be done. Team discusses required queued activities for the upcoming cycle. They put the items they're going to work on in the to-do column. And of course, they're going to have some new items show up along the way too. They're, they can add them to the Kanban board. and and um, expedite item through the, the system as well. Um, let's see, the cycle planning meeting can really be held as often as needed. Um, if if for, there's some reason there's some urgency and it has to happen every day, okay, that's just great. Um, or it could just be maybe at the start of each master cycle. First half of the meeting is directed by the master chief. Any kind of business they have that the team needs to hear about gets um, brought up there. Any kind of uh, needs that have to be done gets, gets um, brought up and presented to the team. The last half of the meeting, the team selects what they're going to do during the cycle, create the Kanban board with that. During the cycle, so the predefined work that is repeatable is done with uh, kata cards. And so we call these process katas, these repeatable steps. And there are really two ways to handle a kata card. You can do all the work and then look at the kata card and look at the check boxes on it and make sure that you haven't uh, forgotten to check any of those. Or you can have the kata card in your hand as you're actually doing the work and, and kind of do it real time. So it's, you know, each process owner will know kind of what their comfort level is, whether they want to just kind of make sure at the end they have remembered everything or whether they're actually taking it real time in their hand and doing it um, check by check by check. I remember talking about Stable at a American Society for Quality meeting once and when I was, somebody approached me after and said that they used to work at a shipping dock, you know, loading the great big shipping containers off the big cargo ships um, onto the ground in the trucks. Uh, this person told me they had a 150 point checklist for every container they would move with the big crane. They kind of rolled their eyes, talked about what, what a pain that was and I said, oh, so when there was a, a mistake, how expensive was it? 
And they said, oh, millions of dollars. It cost millions of dollars when somebody made a mistake. And I said, okay, well, that's why you had a 150-point checklist to govern that process. So the processes get set up as predefined repeatable steps. There's process controls that get made about those steps. You know, your, your standard operating procedure, your CADA cards, your asset recovery models, process recovery models. Then as the steps actually get performed, they get performed with the CADA card as your certificate of, uh, of successful completion. And so we, we think in terms of a quality framework, we think in terms of certificate-based workflows. We're updating our um, service level slam charts. Every day that, that we were successful, the service levels were met, we put a little dot there if everything went normal. If something did not go normal, we put a number there and we write underneath you know, what actually happened. This is another type of slam chart here. You see this one actually has um, a stoplight indicator showing us you know, which of these services have performed flawlessly, which ones um, gave us a little bit of trouble. So 5S housekeeping is the process of um, cleaning our environments. And we do this for 10 minutes after we sit down from a, a Kaizen stand-up. And so we have, these are the, the 5S, uh, five different areas of cleanliness and organization. Sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. You can think about this as a, kind of a flow. You know, what needs to be sorted first, then set in order, then shine, then standardize, and then finally sustain. So sort, think about... Um, you know, what can we get rid of? What's needed and not needed? We can remove unneeded equipment, unneeded items on walls, bolts and boards, etc. Things that just don't belong anymore. And after you've thought of the physical world, think about it, the intellectual world. What kind of email or files or whatever need to be cleaned out. Two, set an order. So have a place for everything. If you have uh, something that needs a place, uh, make a place for it. In uh, a lot of companies that have adopted 5S, you'll you'll go into the conference room and they'll have on the table you'll see a tape, a rectangle, a little re tape rectangle, and then a big tape rectangle, and and that's where the the uh, the you know the remote goes for the projector in the little rectangle, and the keyboard goes in the big rectangle. There's also a rectangle for the mouse, and that's where the mouse goes. And so everything there's a place for everything. And um, that's a way to indicate that. Same with the stapler and the, the paper cutting machine and all that kind of stuff. They'll have um, these, these uh, rectangles all over the tables for where all that stuff goes. And that's this place. So that's set in order. Create a place for everything. Put everything in its correct place. Be sure items are in their correct places. Be sure items are put away immediately after use. Um, sticky notes, whiteboard, markers, etc. There should be a place for them. Three, shine. Clean your workplace on a daily basis. Um, your floors, walls, stairs, etc. are clean. Equipment's free from dirt and grime. Uh, be sure cleaning materials are easily accessible. Um, what about your backups and your license key repositories and all that? Uh, those are organized. Are your backups functioning like they should? It's important to check that. Standardize. So um, make sure best practices are being used. Be sure necessary information is visible. Create any kind of checklist for cleaning and maintenance jobs. Be sure all quantities and lim limits are clear and visible. Is there anything you need that um, you need to get too fast? After you thought of the physical world, think about the, the e-world. Uh, what kind of information do you find yourself going to, maybe frequently or infrequently, that would be a lot easier if it was available to you quickly? Maybe you want to set some bookmarks for it in your browser or maybe even uh, figure out how to work with, with a third or fourth screen. Um, you can you get a lot more done without having to switch between screens a lot. And then finally, uh, sustain. Um, so, you know, make sure that 5S is happening every day. Remember the sequences in the Kaizen stand-up. So we ask ourselves the three questions that are standard in Scrum. What did I do yesterday? What do I intend to do today? What roadblocks do I have? The fourth question is what did I improve since yesterday? And it's whatever I did the 5S with yesterday. That's what I'm telling everybody I did. And you'll notice that when you do a stand-up meeting with that last question, it's really a, a elevation moment. Everybody feels a little bit better because they, they heard about all the improvements that um, their group collectively did. Um, so I challenge you to, to start that now. If you're doing Scrum now, um, start doing the fourth question and 5S um, every day. That, that's a starting point, and I promise you, you will you will feel a little bit of a lift from just that one practice right there that could be your starting point for stable. And so like I said, the fourth question that we add is listed here at the bottom of the stand-up meeting. Um, what have I improved since yesterday? The Kaizen stand-up meeting in stable is a little bit different from the sprint stand-up meeting 
and that it's directed by the Master Chief, it should take 20 minutes or less, and the Master Chief spends five minutes at the start of the of the meeting giving the team any kind of um, company information. If they just pushed a release out, the Master Chief would have been talking to Help Desk and could tell them if there's been any problems with the release or anything they need to know about. Also, if there's any wider company information, like um, you know the company made some big sales or company's expanding or offering a new product line or something like that. The Master Chief really becomes a spokesperson for the business to the team. And so they, I mentioned also we do uh, ad hoc Kaizen teams. So if a, a team member is stuck on something technical, they're, they're free to request some help with it. And uh, ideally somebody could volunteer to spend a few hours with them or half a day or maybe a full day or something if, uh, if they need to. The idea is to get volunteer assistance when people are stuck so that the whole team moves ahead faster. Finishing the master cycle or sprint. So we have the cycle review meeting. This is where the um, master chief directs the meeting. They're basically just going over and making sure the, the metrics are all um, in place and up to date. And they're there with many kind of senior executives that want to be there to hear about how things went during the last cycle. The last meeting is the cycle retrospective where it's just the team gets together. So directed by the master chief, attended by all the process owners, and they ask each other these three questions. What went well during this last cycle? What could have gone better? And then what still feeds the hidden factory? So what is still causing us scrap or rework and delays within our environment? And so they talk about that and make some improvements. And then an optional practice and stable is a Kaizen project. So during each um, cycle, at the Master Chief's discretion, different process owners can pick something in their environment that's bugging them that they want to improve, and they can work on that um, as, as a, a slice of items during the sprint or during the master cycle. The, the thing is, when they're done, they have to report to everybody on what it was, what they worked on, and what they improved. And so that's that we call those Kaizen projects. They're optional. You can even have several people work together on a Kaizen project that will improve the environment somehow. So um, the, the idea is that they will know the best what bugs them. And so they're the ones that could come up with the ideas of what to improve better than anybody around them. And all of this reduces the hidden factory and it's um, we call a level of effort improvement so that going forward we'll get a, a lift from that. And then we have the five principles of stability and so here they are. Anything repeatable can be improved. This is what people that don't understand a quality system need to, to be educated about. What we're doing is we're targeting repeatable work and we're um, taking the tribal knowledge and converting it into institutional knowledge where it will stay forever and then we can improve it. And that's really how to benefit from the concept of continual improvement or process improvement. Well, you have to, if you're going to improve something, what does that really mean? It doesn't just mean to do it different or better. It means to capture that knowledge where it's written down so that going forward that, that learning is available for everybody in the future, not just the person that um, learned that principle and they're now doing it. And they'll do it until they get promoted or the team disbands or they take another job somewhere else and then that knowledge is lost. That's really kind of fake continual improvement. So we want real continual improvement where we're going to store this information for all the future people that will be doing that particular job. Two, improvement requires repetition, reflection, and change, right? Well, repetition just makes things permanent. Reflection and repetition, um, that gives us insight for where we can improve, and then actually changing something is the improvement. Again, if you don't have a quality system in place, I'm not sure that there's really something you can change besides the actual act. The problem with that is that is tribal knowledge. And as soon as that person leaves, that knowledge is gone. So what we want to change actually is our knowledge base. So what can we add in the our knowledge base so that we can capture that, that learning principle and have it there forever for anybody doing that job going forward. Three, sustained improvement requires systematization. Okay, this is the point I've been making. You've got to systematize it before you can implement really one and two in a sustained pace. And so, um, and so uh, the bringing in a quality system, like I said earlier, is bigger than any one employee. You have to have 
um, management understand the benefit and uh, champion the benefit. Four, improve systems, respect people. Always assume positive intent. You know, people don't want to make mistakes. We're just human and we do. Uh, I want to also add that it's important to, when a mistake happens, don't try to punish somebody, but rather um, have them brainstorm how could we make sure this problem never happens again. That's really the trick with improving systems and respecting people. And so um, really a quality system protects us from ourselves. That's how to think about it. And then five, um, speak using data. And uh, speak using data just means what I've been showing you. Use actual facts and statistics to understand what's going on. So here's some common biases that show up that can help confuse us. Naivety bias, this is where inexperience leads to poor decision making or believing everything without looking for supporting facts. Groupthink bias, this is where you're doing something because everybody else thinks that thinks that that's the right thing to do. Confirmation bias is where you cherry pick facts that support what you're thinking and you ignore the facts that contradict what you're thinking. Extreme aversion, so this is where you tend to do what's more convenient, not because it's the best thing to do, but because it's more convenient. Planning fallacy, so this is just underestimating task completion times. An overconfidence fallacy, this is a tendency to overstate your or your team's ability to perform. Reactance bias, this is the urge to do the opposite of what people tell you to do so that you will not feel controlled. Status quo bias, this is where people have a tendency to want things to stay the same. Anchoring bias, this is understanding a scenario based on your own past personal experience, which may not be the same for others. First impression bias, this is where you give the first information the highest weight. Sunk cost bias, this is the, the idea that uh, you've already spent so much money or time on something, you can't stop now. That's a sunk cost fallacy or sunk cost bias. And a framing bias, so this is where a situation is inaccurately explained so that the listener will make a preset conclusion. Six forms of process improvement. Systematization, so creating a quality framework, measuring what's important. Flow means removing roadblocks so that value can flow through your environment as quick as possible. Lean means removing waste so that you have minimal byproduct. Resilience means making a process recover quickly from a problem. And durability means making a process problem proof. And so um, Stable helps you do all of this with your repeatable processes. And finally, the seven steps of systematization. So these are seven steps to uh, setting up Stable in an environment. Um, first one, identify domain value propositions. What are your endpoints? What does your team actually deliver for the company? Two, establish expected service level metrics. So of all those endpoints, what are the expected service levels? Maybe some of them are contractually agreed upon with customers. Maybe not, they're just service level goals. Three, identify standard workflow steps. So from each of those endpoints, look backwards upstream and think about what are the actual steps that happen to produce this endpoint. Four, create process control entries for each of those process steps in the process asset library, that centralized repository. Don't be too worried about the standard operating procedures. You know, really those won't get read much. Just put something down to begin with, and in time, um, they'll get more and more accurate. Five, establish a standard workflow chain of custody checkpoints. So, um, okay, so what are all the checkpoints going from? Um, the one side of your value streams to the other. Remember, each deliverable has its own value stream going backwards. Sometimes they share some steps upstream, that's okay, but eventually they have their own unique value stream that is, you know, ends at the value proposition for that product or service. So what you want to do is figure out where the checkpoints are and make kata cards between each of the checkpoints for the repeatable steps. And then six, going forward, perform the standard workflow using the kata cards. And seven, as new problems occur and get resolved, augment the appropriate kata card template with what to watch out for so that problem never happens again. These are basically the seven steps for implementing the stable framework. Process tailoring, some things that could change or maybe don't want to change. You want to keep doing your master cycles, your system backlog, cycle planning and review meetings. 
different things you may want to adjust to fit your environment better, length of your cycles, um, length of your planning and review meetings, and then um, how often you want to do Kaizen projects. So let's look at practically what we're talking about when we apply the stable framework to different departments in IT. Here's a typical operations model. We're scheduling something, we're doing it, we're checking to see the results. If it failed, we do it again. And then if we need to make an adjustment, we adjust and then the cycle starts again and we keep going and going and going. So here's operations with stable involved. So the scheduling piece, we got our system schedule, a system backlog, which may give us more work to do. Kanban flow and daily Kaizen, stand-up meeting. The do process, we got our process katas for our repeatable steps. Our process SOPs that we would write and make sure that they're up to date. Process recovery models, if there's a problem with the process, and more likely an asset recovery model, if there's an asset that has failed somehow, we can go straight to it find out what the symptoms are, find a, a past root cause that matches the symptoms, do some research, find out, yep, that's what it is, and then fix it. I remember um, in my past once uh, we had a, a primary server fail over onto the secondary node and the DBA got right on it and three and a half hours later figured out that what really happened was that the backup failed the night before, it left the database in full recovery mode, which generated lots of log files all day long during production filled up the database, caused the server to crash and fail over onto the second node. He was telling me, yep, that's what it is. As I was walking away, I heard him say, we had this exact same problem six months ago. Right, so the question was, why did it take three and a half hours to figure that out again? Right, you see the problem? We're losing information if we don't institutionalize our knowledge, and that's what a quality system does. Check, service levels met, Process caught a cards, process caught a checkpoints, those are all filled out. Key performance indicators, if we have to collect any towards some, some organizational goals, we could do that. And then the adjust, continuous improvement, value stream mapping, root cause analysis, Kaizen teams, those are all different components that can help us adjust with the adjust part of operations. Implementation, so here's an implementation model. After a sales contract is made, there's a discovery exploration phase where you're getting their IP structure and you know their hardware and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, there's a prep phase where you're maybe um, staging some equipment if you need to and ordering stuff. And then um, initial implementation where you, somebody goes out there on site or you do it through the web where there's some initial setup for one or two workstations just to make sure that it's working properly. If there's a failure, you go back and fix whatever and try it again. If your beta is working with a few workstations, then you do full implementation with the rest of the customer site. And then you test that also, maybe a smoke test or something to make sure it's working everywhere. And then finally, there's a sustainment phase where you're making sure that they have access to training and the help desk and all the financial stuff is where it should be. And so that's a typical implementation model. So with stable, um, here's how we would enhance it. So we'd have a um, discovery caught a card where we uh, make sure to look for, for different things that uh, make us more thorough based on past experience. Preparation caught a card. Does the project plan you know, create it? Does it, uh, does it have the manager's approval? Does it have the tech director's approval? All that kind of stuff. Initial implementation caught a card. So was a smoke test successful? Full implementation are all sites up and running. Uh, is training completed? Maybe you do another smoke test on just a few other um, workstations. Sustainment caught a card. Is the help desk info in place? Is the customer billing in place? And so these caught a cards start off small, and as real problems occur, they get added to. You know, when when you identify a brand new root cause, um, they get added to. That's how we become preventative instead of just inspecting for problems. Here's a DevOps model. Now you'll often see the DevOps model as a a um, infinity symbol kind of going like a loop going back and forth really one side of that is a development model the other side of it is the actual DevOps process so so this is sort of one half of the infinity model here we have um, the coding process happens with the developers they check in the code and then the DevOps process begins so you'd update whatever automated testing scripts need to be updated perform automated testing perform automated load testing run antivirus and if any of these fail, you kind of go back to the, the beginning and fix whatever. 
And then finally, you automate the deployment process to production. And if there's a failure, then you go back and kind of start that process again. Here's DevOps model with stable involved. And so we have the different uh, Kata cards you'd see here uh, that govern each of those processes. You can read through those. And if you're doing formal development that's not agile based, um, we, this is the, uh, the traditional V model that uh, we've all become accustomed to that have been in the industry for decades. And so, you know, you start with an idea, the concept, and then um, analysis or requirements, um, design, um, where you're actually um, building the component and the screen mockups, and then the coding process and the build process. And then you have maybe a smoke test to make sure that the build produced all of the components that are supposed to be there. Then a component test to make sure that the components are built right. Um, a system test to make sure that um, everything is put together right. User acceptance test, make sure the requirements came out correctly. And then finally, you know, does it sell in the industry? If any of these things fail on the right side of the V model, then we um, we follow the corresponding failure and recovery track back back to the left side of the V model. This is um, still relevant for product design that's that's outside of software. So here's the development, V model development process with stable. We have Kata cards for each of these repeatable steps and each of these repeatable steps. And finally, we have the Scrum model. This is um, based off PMI's ACP Scrum model, which is uh, Scrum with a few accessories added to it. Uh, this is a, a, a full model that um, gives you a starting point, which is really useful. And this is also the model used in the uh, Certified Stable Scrum Master and Certified Stable Product Owner certifications. So we start with a vision meeting where we charter our project, create kind of a one-page cover um, sheet of what our project's all about, who's involved, what the objectives are, success criteria. Release planning meeting is where we create our product backlog and uh, we do our user stories and etc. And then we start off in um, the sprint. So we have our first sprint planning meeting and then we have our you know daily scrum and uh, sprint demo, sprint retrospective, software release, and we kind of keep going until our product has met the success criteria. Maybe every three months we'd have this release planning meeting and that's what they recommend. And then uh, we just keep moving along until our project is complete. So if you're doing stable with Scrum, you would have a vision meeting, caught a card, you know, a sponsor present, end user present, team present, problem statement discussed, objectives, risks, and constraints agreed on, you know, success criteria agreed on, that should probably be there. Release planning, caught a card, do we have real user input or are we just sit in a room talking to ourselves? Have we organized the requirements by MVP and MMF, you know, minimal viable product um, for version one and then everything else after that would be a minimal marketable feature set version two, three, or four. Is it scalable? Have we, can, have we thought about what we need to do to make it scalable? How about some um, security? So do we have our um, security layer in place and do we know what our different um, user privileges are and what kind of data needs to be secured? Uh, can we capitalize on a service oriented or architecture? And is there some way to use uh, the uh, products of a lot of different projects to, to help each other with an SOA kind of structure? Code complete caught a card. Is the architecture reviewed, design reviewed, code reviewed, user acceptance confirmed, and version number updated? So yeah, all the programmers would have to uh, make sure that's all in place. Testing caught a card. You know, was the install upgrade test successful? Did we confirm a new version number? We've all produced products where, you know, the build was correct, but the build number had not been incremented. I'm sure you've all experienced that once or twice. Was the smoke test successful? And uh, did we get all of it? Component test successful, system test successful, antivirus test successful. And so as you have real problems, you just to find out the root cause step and you add um, items onto your Kata cards for those actual root, root cause problems. And it sounds like a, a little thing to do, but it has a huge impact downstream. We call that the stable proposition where, um, you know, it's a little bit of extra work to do, but it saves you so much time downstream for not having to chase around the hidden factory that shows up because using stable it, uh, it brings that hidden factory down to near zero and so that's the long and short of the stable framework so i hope that uh, this answered a lot of questions and helped you understand what it's all about 
At this point, if you want to get certified, you can take the stable exam, and if you pass the test, then you'll be certified. There is a link for the stable framework book in PDF format, so it's an open book test. If you don't have the book in front of you, you can use the PDF and, and have confidence implementing stable, and if you do it right, it will change your life.